This is Dr. Paul Bungie. I'm going to talk a little bit more about hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. This is a little bit of a longer video than usual, so bear with me. This is for those who are very interested to find out whether hydroxychloroquine works for COVID-19. We have to understand a few things about it and then a few things about statistics. So hydroxychloroquine is a, was a malaria drug, so it's one of the anti-malarials. It's really used more often in the United States for inflammation. So it's, it has some anti-inflammation properties, and it's used for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. It's not that strong, and uh, it's used quite a bit, and it's felt generally not to have too many side effects. Um, it has some in vitro activity against viruses. Um, that means it seems to work somewhat in the test tube. Here it is in how it's kind of blocking some of the immune effects in lupus. So it's blocking some of the hormones and some of the signaling pathways to produce junk, immunological junk that's not effective and uh, reduce inflammation. Here it's blocking, and this may be, here it's blocking, and this may be how so it changes the pH of the parts of the cell so that the virus effectively does not get into the cell and do its work as easily. So that's the theory, but theory and practice are simply not the same thing. So the question is, when we're trying to think about whether you use a drug or not, or new treatment or not, how do you know if a drug, for example, will help you or if it will hurt you or if it doesn't do anything? So typically now we use uh, a level of evidence pyramid. Uh, this has been worked on a long time um, by, by many folks in medicine, and it's called a field called evidence-based medicine. So at the bottom is expert opinion, and then we come to case reports and case series. So I saw a patient, I tried this, it seemed to work, so I'm going to tell somebody else about it. And for a long time in medicine, that was how, the, how things worked. Where doctors told each other or passed on information, and it it's, it is a way to grow medicine, it is a way to get evidence, but we think that we have better ways now if we can coordinate and communicate and do larger numbers. So we go to case control studies, cohort studies, randomized controlled trials where you try to get rid of a lot of kinds of biases in medicine because people are biased when they use a new drug, maybe they own it, they think it'll work or they're just hopeful for it. So you double blind so people don't know if they're taking a drug or placebo, you don't, you try to have the researcher not know uh, and you can get rid of some of these biases and actually get a lot better uh, information, more accurate information about whether something works or not. And if you can put information together in a systematic review, some, some people would say that's higher up on the uh, evidence pyramid. So you need to understand this a little bit to understand what we're going to talk about later with some of the trials. The other thing I would tell people about when I'm teaching residents and students uh, is something I would say is the cost-benefit ratio. On the vertical part of the chart, you have increase in benefits. So how much will your therapy improve the life or the, you know, improve the, the, the improved suffering or lengthen life in the case of a patient versus on the horizontal axis, how much will it cost? How much money, how much effort, how many side effects do we need to endure to get the benefit? So you can see on the left-hand side of the curve, low cost intervention has, has improves things quite a bit. But as you get up the scale, the thing starts to level off. So you're, you're, you're paying more and more money and more and more side effects to get less and less of a benefit. So for example, uh, down here on this part of the curve, what I would think of is running water in a community. If a village doesn't have running water, there's a lot of diarrheal diseases, a lot of other diseases. People die, kids die at a young age, uh, maternal, um, maternal mortality is high. And just having a well in the village causes a lot of benefit for a small price, a small investment, uh, comparatively. And it's obvious. You don't need to do a randomized study. This is so obvious to everyone involved that there doesn't need to be some PhD scientist measuring everything with a placebo. But when you're up here on the curve, there is le less benefit and there's a considerable more investment in time or, or cost or effort, or maybe the patient has a lot more side effects. 
So up here on the curve, well, there's a lot of modern medicine is up here on the curve where we're debating, we're having uh, trials with 10,000 people in it to try to see if this drug improves heart attacks more than aspirin, for example. So there's, the, you have to know where you're on the curve when, you make, when you're doing a study and you need to understand that what might, where you might look like you're benefiting, uh, you're actually maybe harming someone. Down on the left-hand side of the curve, no, it, it's obvious it's benefiting. But up here on the right-hand side, uh, sometimes our, tr our drugs and our therapies can hurt people and, and kill people. And we need to be very careful uh, when we're having a new drug, when it's not extremely obvious that it's working to do very good studies. So how about the studies in hydroxychloroquine? Well, there, besides the theoretical benefit there on, in the petri dish, there were some initial reports out of China, small um, numbers of people where they used hydroxychloroquine seemed to help. Um, so decrease uh, um, clinical severity of pneumonia, for example, but small numbers in, in the trial. And small numbers means less statistical uh, power to say, hey, this really worked versus it seemed to work or we tried it in these people and we uh, randomly they got better or they we, we think they got better, we measured them getting better, we were hopeful for it. And then in France, a small study came out initially in March, more recently published, but initially the report came out in March about uh, using hydroxychloroquine and versus hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin versus control. And it seemed to, and it did, show that the people who took the hydroxychloroquine and even more so the, the combo, they got rid of their virus faster. Instead of shedding virus for six days or 10 days, they, they shed it less. So that was very hopeful. And at that point, I thought that we were gonna be using hydroxychloroquine more. Folks that are using it around the country, we were very hopeful for it. But then study after study after study since then with higher numbers of patients in um, prevention, in treatment, in vial shedding has not been as impressive, making most doctors and scientists think that this uh, French study was more a random finding than actual proof, uh, which the small numbers it had uh, would certainly could happen. Um, here is the most recent thing published in the New England Journal, which is a prevention study showing uh, hydroxychloroquine um, did not show statistical significance between placebo in preventing people from getting COVID-19 when they were exposed to it. Um, so the, and a fairly uh, hefty dose involved too. So we shouldn't have to blame it on uh, blame the problem on the dose. Uh, you can see there may be some distinguish you know between the two groups on day 14, but those lines show uh, confidence intervals. So the lines are crossing even though the dots are not together. So lines are, are uh, not separated enough to show that this is statistically significantly better. Uh, it was, if it was some benefit, it was not dramatic um, and it wasn't statistically significant. And I would say this, this does not show proof that it works and it was a large study. It did show side effects like the other studies are showing. You can see that 17% of the people had side effects with their hydroxychloroquine, 8% with placebo and uh, nausea and upset stomach diarrhea and vomiting were the, were the side effects that apparently with this higher dose that we don't see so much in the lupus. Um, and so we're going on to this, you know, cost versus benefit. Is it helping? You're, you're either flatlined or going down here. So it's, it's uh, side effects are, are happening in this cases and the benefit is not proven. There are, as a good study if you wanna look if you want to look yourself, and I'm going to go into some of these, uh, go to the medical letter, the medicalletter.org. This came out recently. It's usually costs to look at their data. They are um, unsponsored. The drug companies do not pay them. So they've been a very good resource over the years of an objective place to, for doctors, uh, providers to go and find data about new therapies. So the medical letter is really good. You should recommend it to your provider. Um, and they, but they put this uh, COVID-19 resource free. They, they usually don't put so much detail on their um, surveys. They kind of give it more of a summary, but they, I think they saw what was happening with all this debate and some of these treatments. So they put the more raw, some of the more raw 
uh, and detailed um, summaries of their studies on their webpage. And uh, so if you go to their website, you could go to that uh, uh, Drugs for Coronavirus, click on that and you'll get all kinds of stuff. If you go to the hydroxychloroquine section, there's tons of studies that they review. Some are published, some are not yet published. For example, we'll go through some of these. Um, um, there's one hospitalized patients with pneumonia. There was 181 patients. They also go over the ones I went over, but here's some other ones. 181 patients, retrospective, hydroxychloroquine versus placebo, and no difference between who died and who went to the ICU between those two groups. Uh, another one, the VA in the U.S., 368 patients. It's retrospective. They did hydroxychloroquine and placebo and azithromycin with hydroxychloroquine, and there was no difference in the results between mechanical ventilation. Um, and then they had higher deaths in the hydroxychloroquine uh, group, actually. So, and again, this is retrospective. These, there's a lot of limitations on these studies. The studies are done quickly. Um, and not, you know, fully randomized and blinded, uh, but this is what we have so far. And then in May, uh, 1,376 patients, there were conse uh, uh, consecutive hospitalized patients, so it wasn't, you know, randomized, uh, again, blinded, it wasn't all that stuff. Um, and the hydroxychloroquine pa treated patients had more severe illness, illness so they divided hydroxychloroquine in placebo, and just observed. They really didn't select the patients. They just gave some to some patients and not, and then looked back and saw how they did. And there was no there was no obvious association, no obvious improvement when the patients who got hydroxychloroquine. Um, a lot of limitations on that study, though. And then in uh, uh, in this study, 150, no difference between the um, uh, conversion. This was no difference between people who got uh, got rid of their virus shedding uh, or not. So that was a kind of a little bit, well, it was definitely a bigger study than the French study. And a lot of people had uh, diarrhea with hydroxychloroquine. So in this study from Michigan, they had consecutive patients, which was retrospective, so it was not randomized. They had hydroxychloroquine and erythromycin. Some people got hydroxychloroquine without azithromycin, and some got neither one of the drugs. So they had a lower mortality with the hydroxychloroquine in it than the other two groups, which was odd uh, and didn't make much sense uh, in terms of why would the hydroxychloroquine work better than the combo group. But there was some benefit in this study, and it was statistically significant but observational. The high, high recovery trial of four, almost 5,000 patients, hydroxychloroquine versus not, the 28-day 28 mortality, 28 mortality was not different. Uh, this was a very big study and had a lot of impact on people's um, thinking and, uh, and didn't show any improvement. If, like I said, you think about that curve, you know, we are up on the right side of the curve. If, even if it was to show an improvement, this is not the miracle drug. I mean, this is not curing everybody in the hospital. Uh, you can obviously see from this study 5,000 patients in, in Britain. All right, then we have um, hospitalized patients on oxygen, 504 of them, and then the open label, they, they did randomize, and they divided in hydroxychloroquine and uh, placebo and the combo. They had QT prolongation, which is a heart rhythm risk, and liver enzyme elevation more frequently hydroxychloroquine, did not improve clinical status at 15 days. So to summarize all this information and try to make some practical decisions, what I would say is this medicine is clearly not on the left side of the curve. It is not the miracle drug. It's not, it's not going to save everyone. It probably doesn't help with COVID at all. There may be some use for it, and there are plenty of studies still ongoing. I, don't, I wouldn't prescribe it. I would say if somebody wanted to, wanted to do a study on it, want to participate in the study, that would be the way to explore it at this point. I, I don't think it has a place in, in the hospital and the clinic right now. This is Dr. Paul Bungie.